I must admit, hearing the boom of thunder was the first step to an erection. It was at the pharmacy, which sucks because I'd rather be at home enjoying it than being stuck at work. What made it even better was that there was a tornado warning issued for that area, and that once again made it worse because I would rather die at home. There were hardly any windows in the pharmacy, or at least not in the area they put me in. What we got instead were white walls and tiled floors that better suited for a mental institute. We would have to walk a good 20 feet in the oppressive space of medicated racks if we wanted the luxury of a window. What I saw captivated me because the rain came down like a monsoon and the trees danced violently with the angry winds. If I was at home, I would be staring for hours. Unfortunately, that wasn't about to happen. My good pharmacist friend Cornelius Venkowski came up from behind. He never had anything important to say. He was on this mission to get me over Char and my introversion and be with a woman. This time was no different. He said to me, I caught that Brittany chick staring at you when you were walking to the window. You should, you should go over there and talk to her. I never noticed this before, but Cornelius looked like a weasel with slicked back dark hair. I'm jealous myself because I have none. Cornelius always labeled himself as fat, but I like to think of him as big boned. If he worked out, he'd probably have a good build, but he probably figured why should he? He was married with two kids, and his wife definitely had him on a leash. Very seldom we would hang out at the local independent wrestling joints, provided that his wife authorized him permission. Now, I don't know why he was pushing for me to ask this Britney chick on a date. She was widely considered to be the hottest girl at the pharmacy. She was, she was tall, slender, noticeable luscious curves, and long blonde hair that I swore I saw in a modeling magazine when I was 10. This girl was way out of my league, and most of the time she walked with her nose in the air as if avoiding male contact at all. I wasn't going to bother her with a reply, but to get him off my back, I said, I don't even know what to say to her. Invite her on John's boat. Seriously, tell her there's an event coming up on John's boat and she should go. Then, check this out. We get her drunk, push it to in one of those private rooms. Oh, man, th that's so wrong. Yeah, but, but think about it. That would be the hottest chick you would ever lay. Char was hot. No, dude, she can't be as hot as that. It was in that moment when we looked that she flung her hair back. It was like in those movies where you'd see the hot girl and in slow motion you watch as she twirled her hair. The slow motion didn't happen, of course, but I like to think it did. Look, Cornelius explained, I think she looked over at you. I think she was looking towards the door. I'm serious, now is your chance, go talk to her. I was pushed forward like a rag doll. Somehow this motion caught her because she... I didn't think she would say anything. Sometimes she would just avoid me or just not saying anything at all when I spoke to her. Then, like an idiot, Cornelius loudly whispered, Talk about the weather! I say idiots because I think she heard him say that. Then I said the most cliché line you can give anyone when you can't think of anything to say. I asked, So, uh, how about that weather? What happened next surprised me. Cornelius, a few co-workers, the ghosts that walked the pharmacy, the angels in heaven, and even God himself nearly choked on his martini when she actually said to me, I know! I love storms! It wasn't much, but she was actually inviting a conversation. The funny thing about conversations were like they were like games. One person speaks, the other engages a sentence or two back, then in hopes to follow up with another conversation, and in this case, I just hope this conversation will keep going without it feeling too awkward on her part. Then as casually as I could, I replied, Me too, I was just thinking how I would rather be at home enjoying it than being stuck here. Did this spark up a response? There was a couple brief seconds for him to ponder, and then she replied with, I hate it here too. I have to drive all the way from Howell to get here. Really? That's that's a long drive. Oh no, I was running out of things to say. I couldn't come up with something to follow up with. She was bound to get awkward in this conversation. I could almost feel the heat of sweat coming from the dome off my bald head. Then a loud boom of thunder jumped both of us. It felt like it shook the whole pharmacy. To my relief, it saved the conversation. Wow, I said, that shook the whole pharmacy. We were both about to share our surprise with that massive grin on our face when my arch nemesis, J.R. Thompson, broke up the conversation. He said, why are you talking to this slacker over here? And then he said to me, don't you have some work to get done? I always thought J.R. looked like an old fisherman. He sported a gray oval-shaped beard around his chin that matched the color gray of hair ringing around his fucking head. Now, I'm not sure if it's just an act, but he always seemed in a bad mood everywhere he went. Most of the time, he came off as a grouchy old man, unless some hot young girl happened to be talking to him. Then all those muscles he uses for a smile would start to hurt. 
It's funny because his wife worked with him, and she never seemed to mind his flirtatious ways with the young women. Cornelius tried to coach me into breaking up her and JR's conversation, which consisted of smiles, nodding, and talking. Maybe I was just being a pussy, but I felt it was too late. My dumbass just stood there and watched as neither of those two acknowledged me standing there like a psychotic watcher. All I needed was a tree next to me, and I'd be all set. Then our secretary, Charnette, an obese black woman, ran into the pharmacy with arms waving, yelling, A tornado is heading this way! Then, like out of nowhere, she just flew up like a dra- she just flew up like dragging a mouse across the computer screen. She was gone off the roof in an instant. Suddenly that vibrating noise we heard earlier was all around us, with winds violently shaking the building, and the warning sound of a train was gradually getting closer and closer. Maybe I was just dumbfounded for a few minutes, but it just registered that the ceiling had a few openings to the mucus green sky. I could feel the strong winds circulating from the crevices, almost whirling around me as I felt my scrubs weigh me on down to the floor. He had to shout because the winds were getting really loud at this point, and mostly because they were already circulating around the pharmacy. He yelled, Hurry up! We gotta take shelter! Where? I yelled back. Anywhere! The three ran down the aisle of the medication racks that were rolling back and forth with the wind. We heard a concussive blast from the ceiling above that startled Brittany into a sharp yelp. I looked up and noticed more pieces of the ceiling being taken away with some blurry images of the sky. The tornado's right above us, yelled JR. Those racks just kept getting in the way. One slid past with us full well knowing it was going to slide back and probably hit us. We kept moving along, each competing and keeping Brittany as safe as possible. What made matters worse was that the electricity was going on and off, and spots of darkness affecting our vision made dangerous rock dodging worse than it already was. The three of us were holding hands, with Brittany in the middle, so I didn't have to touch JR's hand. At some points, the periods of darkness were a little longer, which caught our breath, because if the darkness didn't come back, we were going to be in big trouble. I could hear the sound of a train getting deafeningly loud, and even I knew that we had mere seconds before all hell broke loose. One of the racks was spinning out of control. I grabbed Brittany close to me as we maneuvered out of the way and nearly pushed with the rack to the other side. JR waited for us at the other side and pulled us out before being spun around again. At that point, it was getting more chaotic. A rack was closing in on us like a wall about to smash us into another rack. JR pulled us away, seeing an opening between two racks that led to an aisle free of the mess. I managed to pull Brittany through just in time before the racks had a chance to close in and smash us. By the time we reached the aisle over, she looked over at me. First, I didn't know what it was until I realized from her looking down that I was holding her hand. Quickly in embarrassment, I let go. Then we heard something in addition to the wind that sounded like decking. Then I heard. Then we heard something in addition to the wind, which sounded like decking playing cards. Neither of us wanted. Neither of us wanted to, but we turned around anyway to see the tiles from the floor rise up in a pattern that was coming towards us. Brittany and I briefly wide-eyed each other and took off running just behind in a towel with Jr. The tiles, the tiles rose closer and closer, and we felt the suction of the wind pulling us back. Up ahead, I saw the mounted table that I frequently use every day. Never thought I would ever rely on that as our safety measure. Brittany was falling back, so I took her by the wrist and instructed everyone to jump! And the three of us dove right on the tabletop and held on for our lives. The suction of the wind sent us all on an angle and cluttered our feet together in waving bumps. Through all the deafening chaos of wind and trains, I heard the drivers banging on the door. I had forgotten that they didn't have access out of the driver's area, and they were trapped like prisoners in there. Fortunately, it was too late for them, as I heard the sound of shattering glass and those desperate hands on the window pane sucked back like they were sent through a jet engine. Then I heard the spark of bad electrical wiring. The printers we used to print our labels danced in the wind over each other and were pulling to our general direction. I tried to warn the others, but the strong currents of winds overpowered my voice. One flew my... One flew my general direction, and I dodged, releasing one hand and grabbed quickly back for comfort. Another fl flew at Brittany, and I used my quick reflexes out of nowhere to hit it away from her as it passed by. Then the tabletop slid. It was coming loose. I had forgotten that the tabletop was never sturdy since it was put back on. We may be in some big trouble. Desperately, I tried to attach my hands to something stable so, so I could put pressure on the tabletop to the actual table. Then I quickly realized that it didn't work because the tabletop slid off to the crevice in the ceiling and Brittany flew back. I reached out, grabbed her hand, but found myself flying off only to be grabbed by JR, who held on. I shouted to him, Thanks for saving me! To which he replied, I wasn't saving you! This brought a smile to her face again. 
That smile quickly vanished when everything suddenly went still. Then we found ourselves falling into the opening of the table. It hurt like hell, but it was even worse when we looked up. Falling debris fell on the table, and we found ourselves trapped in pitch darkness. I think texting Cornelius on my cell worked because the firefighters muscled off the debris to get us out of the table. One of them commented, what, no threesome? Which was what I was thinking. A firefighter carried me off from a firefighter carried me off from the debris, and I was shocked to find that the entire building collapsed. He asked me repeatedly if I wanted a hospital, and I repeatedly declined. Cornelius waited for me at the other end and asked the usual question if I was all right. I nodded and looked off to see Brittany in JR's arms. I felt something at the pit of my stomach. I saved her life a countless number of times, and I still wasn't acknowledged. Watching her reminded me of why I shunned off dating in the first place. Don't worry about it, assured Cornelius. I saved her, I told him. I'm sure she knows that. Yeah, I don't think so. A black SUV pulled up, and some of the co-workers had to dodge out of the way. It was our boss, John Catella. With his transitional glasses styling out of the vehicle, I can recognize that receding hairline anywhere. Word around the pharmacy was that he never cracked a smile, and I haven't once seen that happen. He looked young, thin, with a little meat around the edges, and noticeable gray spotting with his brown hair. From the looks of it, he must have gotten back from one of those facilities, because he was wearing his brown hooded coat he always walked out with. All right, everyone, yelled out our fearless leader, who I was sure to be the voice that would calm all these hysterical people down. You know the drill. We need to make up. You know, we need to meet up at the Kresge's parking lot. With what car? Asked Tim, a burly. With what car? Asked Tim, a, blur, a burly black guy that worked in the IV department. He pointed out the flooded parking lot of cars turned over on their backs. <laughs> John analyzed. I see a car that hasn't been tampered with. Whose vehicle is that? We can use it as transportation. Somebody tell me whose car that is. Are you insane? Asked Tim. We have all been in some trauma. The last thing we want is to go somewhere to get sucked in some tornado. Have some mercy. Look, people, I, I know you've been through a very traumatic ordeal, but we still have a job to withhold. <laughs> we need to shake off the nerves and get back to work. I, I know if I was in that building, I'd be scared too. The best thing for you to right now is to think to yourself, I am alive right now. I'm alive. Just repeat that to yourself. Once you realize that you're alive, shake those unnecessary nerves off and start thinking about what's best for Grandma. Grandma needs you right now. On my watch, you're still on company payroll. Some woman spoke out who worked in some department I never go to and shouted, I ain't going nowhere. I have a family to check on. As far as I know, my baby is probably sucked up in that tornado. John maliciously responded, Then make another one. If your family's is dead, then there's nothing that can be done about it. You might as well finish out the day's service and grandma. The woman replied, I'm going home. Then John held up his wrist with no watch and said, Is it time for you to go home yet? I don't think so. Fen, if you decide to go home, that's the point. Now let's find out who owns that vehicle, get to that parking lot. I promise you, once we finish out the day, there's pizza for everyone. A pizza party? Cornelius whispered to me, you know whose cars that is? Then I regretted my response of, yeah, that's mine.